chapter 2, book of James. All right, James chapter 2. After we pray, we're going to be going to Romans chapter 4. Bless you. And we're going to be looking this morning at a most misunderstood passage of Scripture. James chapter 2, we're going to be reading verse 9 through verse 26. And once you've found your place in James, it will all stand for the reading of the Word of God. James chapter 2, beginning at verse 9 and down to verse 26. And the Word of God says, But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. What, pro what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? The scripture was fulfilled, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Holy Father, I pray and ask again for your blessings, Lord, upon this message. And I pray, Lord, for the guidance of your indwelling Holy Spirit, that, Lord, that all that is said and done here this morning is done according to your purpose and will and to the glory of yourself and to your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray and ask this, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Go to Romans chapter 4. No, your preacher hasn't gone nuts. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Romans 4. We're going to do a lot of reading here. Romans 4, 1 through 25. Write down the entire chapter and then the first verse of chapter 5. All right. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. 
Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Praise God. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had been yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end of the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope, believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken so shall thy seed be and being not weak in faith he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old neither yet the deadness of sarah's womb he staggered not at the promise of god through unbelief but was strong in faith having glory or excuse me giving glory to god and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. And 5 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are today a great many that teach faith and works are necessary to both gain and to keep salvation in Jesus Christ. James chapter 2 is a portion of scripture to which they will often resort to as support for that position. But as we just got done reading here in Romans chapter 4 and 5, okay, it directly opposes this teaching. So we have an apparent contradiction of scripture here between Romans and James. Now this was one of the things that was an absolute consternation to Martin Luther. Okay, Martin Luther got saved by reading Romans 4 and 5. Then he runs into James and his comment about James is, <laughs> I would like to take James and tear it out of the Bible and burn it. It is a right dry epistle. He hated James. But we are going to get too rough on Martin. Again, number one, we knew he was saved out of Catholicism. He didn't understand the right division of Scripture as yet at this point. And so, like so many, you know, he was confused. And he sees this conflict here uh, with these. Uh, 
he didn't have the knowledge of the fact that doctrinally not all the scriptures are written to the New Testament church and that is the key to understanding how to rightly divide the words of truth you know not doing so is what has led to a great many heresies and false teachings over the last 2,000 years. Now, this is kind of an extension, if you will, to some extent from last week's messages about false gospels. We're going to compare both these passages this morning uh, in order to address and to clear up the apparent contradiction. Okay? Got to lay ground rules, so as always. I mean, the very first rule you know, the very first measuring tool that we need uh, to apply is the issue to this issue is, okay, from which scriptures does the New Testament church take its job in? Okay, well, we've got one easy division, Old Testament, New Testament. Okay, so New Testament church, so the Old Testament, we don't take doctrine from the Old Testament. All right, that's the first and easiest division right there. All scripture can be used historically, doctrinally, or spiritually, okay, depending upon to whom it was written. Now, historical is easy. It's just history. It's when it was written. Okay, uh, that's pretty easy. You know, so if you want, if you're looking at things from a historical perspective, pretty simple when it comes to that. Doctrinal and spiritual are where folks run into problems. <clears throat> Doctrine, okay, is specific to a particular people for a particular period of time. All right? Uh, doctrine is going to be what is required of God to believe, be believed and be practiced by those particular people in that particular period of time. Okay, this is what is known as dispensationalism. Okay. Different required doctrine for different people and period as determined by God. All right. Uh, the baloney that is talking, you know, uh, you know, everybody was saved the same way from Adam. It's, you know, it's just, I mean, you just read the Bible and you know that's not so. You know that's not the case. Has there been grace in every dispensation? Absolutely. You know, and maybe sometime I'll go into a message on that, on how grace has played a part in every doctrinal dispensation. Okay, but when the Lord dispenses revelation, okay, that's what we're talking about. He's dispensing revelation to people. Uh, they are then expected to follow that revealed doctrine, that, you know, the revelation that he has given them. Example, okay, Adam and Eve, okay, in the garden, okay, we've got a time of innocence here. Okay, God dispenses revelation to them. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's it. <laughs> That's all they needed. Okay, their, their dispensation of revelation. Don't eat from that tree. <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, of course, we know. They failed. You know. But that's exactly how it you're going to see the Bible as we go down, and, and we've done this before in breaking it down and showing these things. Okay, the New Testament church must take its doctrine from within the New Testament of the Bible, okay? So, I mean, again, pretty simple. Spiritual, okay? There's the other place where folks get messed up, though, is spiritual application. Okay, spiritual application can be taken from the entirety of the Bible. Uh, as all scripture has been inspired of God and we can learn from it and can apply it to ourselves in his spiritual lessons. Okay, 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God. 
and is profitable. It can be profitable for doctrine, profitable for reproof, profitable for correction, profitable for instruction in righteousness. Okay, we can go through and do a study, and we've done this in the past, on the tabernacle. Okay, that God had Moses assemble in the wilderness, and we can pull a lot of spiritual truths out of there, but we're not under the law. We don't look at that and say, okay, we've got to, you know, bring a lamb or a bullock or a goat or, or whatever it is and go and... No, that's not... Okay, that that's taking something that's doctrinal for a particular people in a particular point in time and trying to apply it to the wrong people in the wrong time. Can we take spiritual lessons from it? Absolutely. Just the same way as we can take a spiritual lesson from don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, God says leave something alone, leave it alone. Because if God says if you do this or don't do that, this is what's going to result. Guess what? That's what's going to happen. Guaranteed. Okay, all scripture contains doctrine, but not all doctrine uh, is for all people all of the time. And that's where you run into false doctrine and heresy. Okay, good example. Physical circumcision. Okay, we were just talking about that there with Abraham. Okay, was given to Abraham as a sign of God's covenant with Abraham and with his descendants. Okay, it was reinforced with the Jews under the law of Moses. Okay, it went from more than just a covenant, it became a law. And by not doing it, you are now committing sin uh, in doing that. Okay, in the New Testament, the law of Moses is done away with. Okay, as a means of justification with God, Romans 10 4. Romans 10 4. Uh, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Right? So, it does, it's not something doctrinal for us. Physical circumcision is also therefore done away with for us. Uh, Romans 4, uh, we read, we just went through the whole chapter, Romans 4, 8 through 13. Okay, and here it talks about circumcision and how it was given and why it was given. Now, if we go over to Ephesians, though, chapter 2. Ephesians 2, uh, 8 through 16. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, okay, that at the time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Go on to Colossians 2. Verses 10 through 14. Colossians 2. 10 through 14. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye were circumcised, how? With the circumcision made without hand, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he hath quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, 
blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Physical circumcision got nothing to do with us. Spiritual circumcision okay, is the case here. Okay? Not all doctrine is for all people at all times. So uh, uh, having established this parameter, now we come to the question of is all of the New Testament written to the New Testament church as far as doctrine is concerned? Okay, the church, okay, to define the church, we're defining as the living organism that began with its head, <coughs> the Lord Jesus Christ, okay, at his resurrection. I mean, you could even go before that. I mean, I think when Christ revealed to the church, okay, which at that time would have been the twelve and uh, the other uh, faithful disciples, what he was going to do, okay, they were then the church, okay, but I mean, if you, you know, like I, I am not a hyper dispensationalist by, at all, all right, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the church began with the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, and those disciples in Jesus Christ. Uh, of course, like I said, we have a trans transitional period that's going to go on. But that organism, if you want to try to block it, I'll call it from the resurrection then of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. That's the beginning. When does it end? With another <coughs> resurrection. The resurrection of the church. The blessed hope. The rapture. Okay? And the church is taken out before the beginning of the seven-year tribulation period. That time frame, that period, that is the church of Jesus Christ. Okay, so what scriptures then in the New Testament doctrinally apply to the church of Jesus Christ? Okay, well, number one, the four gospels of Jesus Christ are out as far as doctrine is concerned. It means the Lord Jesus Christ has come openly as the promised Messiah. And the message to the nation of Israel is repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay? Uh, but go to Matthew, just for a minute, 15. This is why I say I am not a hyper-dispensationalist. And there's a lot more involved with that than, than just this. But here's just one point in it. Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. And he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the